Hello and welcome everyone. It is Active Lab live stream number 44.0. It's May 13th, 2022. Welcome to the Active Lab. We are a participatory online lab that is communicating, learning, and practicing applied active inference. You can find more information at the links on the slide. This is a recorded and an archived live stream, so please provide us with feedback so we can improve our work. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome, and we'll be following video etiquette for live streams. If you want to learn more about the live streams or other activities in the lab, head to activeinference.org. Today in 44.0, we are going to learn and discuss this awesome paper, Therapeutic Alliance as Active Inference, from 2022, by Zoe McParland, Francesco Saratelli, Carl Friston, and Jorge Estvis. And the video is just an introductory review slash scoping and contextualizing. We're going to have some discussions in the coming weeks on this paper with the authors and some non-authors. So we're just going to be overviewing the paper, opening up some threads, getting excited about it, covering what they said so that we can jump into the dot one and dot two discussions. And let's just get right into it. I'm Daniel and I'm a researcher in California. I was very curious about touch and active inference, which is an area that hasn't been explored too much, but it's something that is so critical to our daily experience. So it sounds like a pretty important area to model or approach with active inference and I'll pass it to Ian. So thanks for joining and for all the contribution on the slides. Would love to hear any context and welcome. Hi, Daniel. Thanks very much for um, having me in your lab. So yeah, I, you know, I was drawn to this paper for several reasons. I first um, saw the paper by some of the authors that got me uh, joining the dots between their work and your lab, um, which was, that was called Osteopathy and Mental Health and Embodied Predictive Interoceptive Framework. So I've got an interest in um, how we sense what's going on inside our body uh, from a research point of view and um, a personal point of view. Um, and then also, you know, my main, what I spend most of my time doing uh, work-wise is hands-on therapy, so manual therapy, which involves touch. When I saw the title of this paper, what we're talking about today, which is um, part of their series on inactivism and active inference in the therapeutic alliance, I, you know, what jumped out to me was the um, the word synchrony <clears throat> in therapeutic alliance. So. You know, this is something in the therapy world. We often talk about synchrony, um, and I'm intrigued to see how that might fit in with free energy minimization. Just one thought on what you said there about interoception, which is something we've talked about. I know you've had many conversations and works on it, is touch. It sometimes feels like it's out there, like I'm touching objects on my desk. It's how they are out there, just like vision is something out there. But then touch is actually inside the fingers. And so it's actually like mm. it is an interoception about the external world. So it's kind of like touch is something inside of us. But again, it's out. It's about out external objects. Mm. And so how does the brain and body do that? And then what's the social dynamics of it and then what are the clinical implications i hope those are some questions we can approach with active inference and get some insight into yes yeah and the you know the other thing what you were saying then about um and i think in the, the interception researchers there is a little bit of debate over whether cert, what types of touch might include as interoceptive or in a felt and there's low effective touch versus maybe different types of touch. Um, but also when you were saying that, I was just thinking, you know, um, when someone says I felt touched by that piece of music, um, the music didn't physically touch us apart from oscillating airwaves, 
but touching our eardrums. Um, but again, it might be an interceptive experience if we were touched by some piece of music and it sh sent shivers up and down my spine. So um, yeah, and can voice maybe in therapeutic uh, alliance, vocal, auditory input, touch people. Hmm. Cool. So we wrote out one view of a big question, which is kind of like a curiosity or an openness that might approach somebody to this paper, even without bringing active inference into it. And it says, within a therapeutic alliance, can touch be used to help a patient usefully update their beliefs? And then in the conclusion, the authors are, where, where we're going to get to is, touch appears to be critical in initiating develop the salience of synchronous relationships. Touch can be used to infer and predict other states of mind, which are crucial for developing dyadic and triadic relationships in general and in a clinical setting. So what do you think about that big question or what drew you to it? Mm. Yeah, on the, the surface of that question. So <clears throat> can touch be used to, you know, help a patient? So, you know, um, it seems in kind of the obvious answer is yes, it can. You know, you, you see a um, if a child falls over and a parent comes up and it kind of soothes the child by stroking it or touching it or rubbing it better, then then we can kind of see an archetypal version of that of a caregiver helping someone who's distressed. So I'd say, yeah, you know, yeah, it looks quite obvious, but then you know this usefully updating someone's beliefs. I think that's where it gets uh, maybe in dot one, dot two, um, we can explore that different, mm. uh, more. And you know, what is what is an adaptive up, update and what is a maladaptive update and who's who's setting the pollings and where does synchrony come in? So yeah, um, loads to explore. Um, and, you know, dyadic, they mentioned dyadic and triadic. So, and is therapeutic, we don't have to just think in terms of a professional therapeutic setting. So maybe in, you know, I, I can seek counsel from um, anyone. It doesn't have to be a, a professional practice, a, a practitioner in a business type setting or a clinical setting. It might be um, with a stranger on a bus. Yes. What are the top down social scaffolds that facilitate or enable or constrain certain kinds of touch and clinical relationships. So cool. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the aims and claims of the paper. So as we mentioned, the paper is McParland et al in frontiers in psychology from 2022. And some of the aims, the way that the authors represented what they set out to accomplish in the paper, one of them was to present an empirical integrative account of the biobehavioral mechanisms that underwrite therapeutic relationships through the lens of active inference. And then they're aiming to argue for the importance of therapeutic touch in establishing a therapeutic alliance and synchrony between the practitioner and the patient. And I think this will be really interesting to explore in the context of uh, explicitly manual and hands-on therapies and work, as well as areas that are perhaps not seen like at in the same way as physical therapy or osteopathy, but maybe the dentist just puts the hand somewhere in a way that is calming, for example. So even in not just the only manual areas, and then some of the claims that they make and some that we'll go into a lot more in the paper is they're going to argue that active inference provides insights into the why and the how of humans choosing to synchronize. They're going to claim that touch is used to establish and also to continually develop synchrony in our lived world as social beings. And those are some of the threads that they reference a lot of papers and uh, kind of explore in the paper. So anything that you thought about just in the claims of the paper? Mm. Yeah, when I um, 
first read this, it created, you know, it, it seemed to um, remind me of what I hear in other sort of therapies. So the importance of safety, for example, in a therapeutic setting. So if a person feels safe, then they're going to be more um, receptive to um, therapeutic touch. And the and I'm interested to see on, you know, to read and speak to the authors maybe about um, what things facilitate synchrony. Um, and the, uh, what else have we got there? So, um, yeah, how, just how the active inference framework kind of um, can potentially unify some of these different languages that we've got in different um, therapies that uh, that that kind of maybe are saying very similar things, um, and can does the, the 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 I think we we spoke a few weeks ago the beautiful simplicity of active inference maybe helps to helps to um, unify those and help us understand them better. Awesome. All right. Um, on to the abstract. Perhaps you could read uh, the first four lines and I'll read the second four lines. Okay. So recognizing and aligning individuals' unique adaptive beliefs or priors through cooperative communication is critical to establishing a therapeutic relationship and alliance. Next bullet point, using active inference, we present an empirical integrative account of the biobehavioral mechanisms that the right therapeutic relationship. Third bullet point, a significant mode of establishing cooperative alliances and potentially synchrony relationships is through extensive cues generated by repetitive coupling during dynamic touch and then established models speak to the unique role of affectionate touch in developing communication interpersonal interactions and a wide variety of therapeutic benefits for patients of all ages both neurophysiologically and behaviorally the purpose of this article is to argue for the importance of therapeutic touch in establishing a therapeutic alliance and ultimately synchrony between practitioner and patient. We briefly of therapeutic alliance in pro-social and clinical interactions. We then discuss how cooperative communication and mental state alignment in intentional communication are accomplished using active inference. We argue that alignment through active inference facilitates synchrony and communication. The ensuing account is extended to include the role of C tactile afferents in realizing the beneficial effects of therapeutic synchrony. We conclude by proposing a method for synchronizing the effects of touch using the concept of active inference. Okay. Cool. Active inference as a descriptive integrative account and then towards the end potentially some unique predictions or implications or usages of active inference like mm -hmm. what would be different about the therapeutic alliance if the practitioner and or the patient were to be aware of synchrony or be able to integrate some of these important qualitative ideas like consensual affectionate touch with potentially some of these ideas like priors and precision and synchrony mm, mm. yeah and as you're saying that i'm thinking about you know um uh trauma for example which is you know when a a, a prior is so given so much weighting that it affects action and perception in a really strong way and as you said if if the both the the patient and the the clients in that alliance they're they're aware of it in terms of what the, the updating of that of those beliefs um 
in the whole process and aligned in their the the direction and the process that they're wanting to use to usefully update beliefs then um then yeah really interesting thought being aware of what your the process you're going through cool so that's where we're going to be going and the roadmap is how we're going to be traveling there the paper has three sections introduction with a bunch of subsections the second section is mechanisms increasing saliency within synchrony and the third section is a conclusion and within this very multi-part introduction section they talk about a, a range of topics range uh from physical touch and the clinical and therapeutic setting. There's a lot of discussion on the in utero initiation of synchrony and the way in which there's this transfer of the uterine environment to the postnatal scaffolding through the post postnatal, where I guess most of us are most of the time out <laughs> there in society and the way that touch and communication and synchrony and all these other topics are sitting there in the therapeutic setting and striving for integration. And so they, they bring a lot onto the table with this paper. So it's going to be a great discussions and important lines of research. And in this dot zero, we're going to dive into mainly the keywords and give some background. It'll be awesome to hear about the perspective that you have being a lot closer to this work than I am. And um, we'll just talk about the keywords and then be ready in the dot one and dot two to take it anywhere else. Sound good? Excellent. Okay, the keywords are active inference, therapeutic alliance, affective touch, synchrony, predictive processing, allostasis, free energy principle, and perinatal care. So let's just jump right into the keywords and see where it goes. So first, therapeutic alliance. What would you say about therapeutic alliance? Okay, so um, while reading the text here, Therapeutic Alliance is a collaborative working relationship between clinician and patient, and is cr a critical component of the person-centered care because it contributes to positive clinical outcomes, outcomes across multiple healthcare disciplines. So um, what I like here is that they're sort of saying that it's a critical component. And then, you know, if we... Um, break down the, that term therapeutic alliance, then um, therapeutic meaning, you know, helpful, I suppose, um, to, beneficial to the to the person. And then alliance, as they said it, so it's, um, I think of, you know, being in agreement and working together, um, understanding each other, uh, which is, you know, I think sometimes when people are going to a healthcare provider, it's um, maybe the, the practitioner or the clinician is um, fixing them or doing something to them, and maybe they can be passive to, in receiving that. Whereas I think this term therapeutic alliance is coming for um, for the person receiving. The healthcare and it's uh, then the you know the active inference comes in so it's active for for both par parties not just a passive thing um and i see that uh yep yeah, so there's another text there which kind of says a similar thing so it's um the therapeutic alliance is often modeled from a work the working alliance described by Borden in 1979 which includes the collaborative agreement on goals yep tasks and the development of successful relationships and cooperative communication yeah um, yeah totally true about the alliance and working together as a team and they're also focused on the dyad but 
I thought of like maybe a hospital setting where there's a lot of people of many different specialties working together, like truly as a big team, the family and the, the patients, but also all these other people who come through that space. And then just in terms of the way that this paper approached it, they reference I guess a early critical citation board in 1979 and then also they reference two more recent citations um the Mikiak and Ryu and so on the 2019 paper on the left that paper was mm -hmm. looking at physiotherapy and just highlighted like acknowledging the individual the giving of self and using the body as a pivot point so seeing that alliance as kind of like a constellation that's pivoting around the patient's body and mm -hmm. also there being sort of a, a broader scale movement, which I thought was really deep. And then the Ryu 21 citation, modeling therapeutic alliance in the age of telepsychiatry, mm -hmm. they just begin with something uh, that maybe we've all experienced or seen occur that things are online and remotely and that includes psychotherapy happening online and this paper is like a call for the investigation of the causes and consequences of successful psychotherapy augmented with computational tools and often carried out using computational means of communication so a little bit of a classic take on the therapeutic alliance as well as bringing it into the early 2020s phase that we're in where <laughs> we're having conversations with computers but then where's touch and this disembodiment that could maybe occur if we don't have reminders to re-enter our body during these relationships mm. Mm. yes yeah re-entering our body um the other thing that I was thinking of then when you were sort of reading the um, early uh, reference or the citation, the acknowledging of the individual giving of the self and using body as a pivot, thinking about that um, and something that's coming up later in the, in the, the definitions about this um, expert sort of synchronizing to an expert and maybe there's is there any tension there between the alliance um and agreeing on goals and you know giving um oneself to an expert um so yeah interested to explore that later great so on to synchrony what is synchrony and how is it being used here so the definition in the paper, uh, synchrony is defined as the interpersonal coordination of behavioral and neurophysiological rhythms that can aid in sensory processing, learning, emotion, and arousal regulation, self-regulation, and the establishment of communicative relationship. Um, so uh, another extract from the paper, Therefore, considering the therapeutic alliance principles of agreement on goals, tasks, and developing strong relationships, a degree of biobehavioral synchrony will occur within a clinical setting. So they seem to be saying that, you know, if, if it involves agreeing on where we're heading together, then synchrony has to occur. Um, and on, additionally, they're sort of saying that innate, it is human nature to want to share physiological and emotional states with others through the structured pattern of communication between mother and infant, um, the, in the interaction synchronize and an individual's behavior, hidden states of mind and biological rhythms resulting in an intertwined unit akin to a sophisticated waltz. Um, and I see you've um, put some diagrams there from some um, studies yes. uh, involving drumming. Yeah, I was just looking to see how people were studying synchrony in the modern time where they were studying various aspects of, of coordinated drumming. And I also really like how the authors 
uh, mentioned the sophisticated waltz or insert your own genre of dance or movement or coordination because synchrony is not just um, lockstep metronome, everyone doing the same thing. Synchrony can refer to turn-taking or synchrony can refer to sort of joint improvisation. And that's this notion of generalized synchrony that comes up again and again in active inference. So what does it mean for there to be synchrony in the therapeutic alliance with people who have different expectations, preferences, priors, bodies, minds, lives? So what is being synchronized mm -hmm. that can be measured? The heart rate or some other <laughs> biometric features? And then what is that reflecting and are we looking for lockstep? But then if we're not, what is this synchrony with difference that we're going to be seeking? And how is this related to positive clinical outcomes? Mm, yeah. Yes, uh, so much. Um, I could could go down there and uh, yeah, maybe in the dot one, dot, dot two. And yeah, you know, we will. I link to evolution as well, this... Uh, the, the regimented waltz versus the the more playful um, jamming even. Cool. Yes, we will go there. All right. So one of the ways in which synchrony is going to be engendered and one of the ways that is highlighted in this paper is affective touch. So what is affective touch? Um, quoting from the paper, affective touch via tactile stimulation can be viewed as an example of a particular embodied social behavior that maintains homeostasis and influences the perception of or inference about the mental states of self and other. Moreover, it has been speculated that touch may cause a rapid reduction in the activity of prefrontal cortex before instantiating a sustained period of preemptive homeostatic regulation. It has also been suggested that the use of social touch um, decreases the level of effort needed to overcome stress. So here, you know, from reading that, um, it's sort of saying that effective touch um, is, is nice, I guess, uh, compared to maybe a punch, um, which might have a different <laughs> effect on our uh, regulation, autonomic regulation. Um, and so the next quote is, an effective method for establishing this cooperative alliance and potential synchrony is through ostensive cues generated by repetitive coupling during phys physical touch. Affectionate touch is unique in its ability to foster communication, interaction, and various therapeutic benefits. For example, in the context of perinatal care, it contributes to an infant's development, both neurologically and behaviorally. So again, you know, there's this assumption that um, that the touch is going to have a helpful outcome for the for the the party um, that's receiving it, or both maybe, as opposed to other types of touch which might be, um, you know, update someone's beliefs in a way that isn't adapted. Hmm. The the part that really stood out to me is like social touch decreasing the level of effort needed to overcome stress like mm. a pat on the back which is just one encultured touch that maybe in a different culture or different setting wouldn't be supportive but it's like there's effort needed to overcome some stress mm -hmm. and then there's a pat on the back literally or figuratively and then it's like oh it's less stressful to bring the effort to do this and then that is not a punch, like you said, that would affect a touch. And so what is happening when touch occurs in the body and in the mind? What is decreasing the level of effort and just what is touch doing in that setting? Mm. And then how is that related to synchrony? What What is the belief that's being um, reinforced through touch? So is it you know, something like I'm I'm doing okay. Um, I'm able to cope here. I'm I'm uh you know I 
I am um, an organized being, not a my free energy is minimizing, not max, not increasing. And then at the social level, like I'm there for you, regardless of the outcome or something. It could be many different things, of course, and it may not even be possible to translate it into language because that's mm -hmm. this is its own language of touch. So what is the grammar of that language of touch and how do we make that affective touch, which sounds so endearing and intimate, make sure that it is that way for everybody who's involved in that situation so that it's not like for one person, like their intention is positive in giving or receiving, but then for the other person, it's like nails on a chalkboard, you know? <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, the setting that they uh, mention as critical for affective touch is like the in utero and also the perinatal, like post birth care. So, what's going on with perinatal care? Mm. Yeah, I thought it's uh, really interesting that so much, because, you know, when I first saw this paper, I thought it was about, as you said, um, post, 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 postnatal um, people. Uh, adults going for for some kind of touch therapy but you know it when you dive into the paper there's a lot of time spent on um looking at young how young people learn um so quoting from the paper effective touch is unique in its ability to foster communication interaction and various therapeutic benefits for example in the context of perinatal care it contributes to an infant's development both neurophysiologically and behaviorally, so it's contributing to their development. And you know, I've chosen a pair of um, a potter molding a piece of clay, um, and you know, thinking that infants are if we if we think of a baby as being like a wild animal um, that's born, and the caregivers are really molding it into being something that fits in with the culture. Um, and society sort of uh and neurophysiologically and behaviorally then how does touch contribute to that molding um mm. second quote interpersonal synchrony between parent and infant infant is well documented through non-verbal behaviors such as touch gaze voice particularly in mothers so there they're acknowledging it's not necessarily all about touch um it's you know we've got these other cues facial expressions, tone of voice that um, may facilitate or be involved in synchrony between the parent and in infants in shaping their development. The the clay metaphor is really interesting and it, it makes me think about how the baby, the larva, is born physically softer. Like a lot of the bones are not converted to their final hardness and the skull has some openings and some flexures that decrease throughout life but never go away and so mm. it's like that also has analogy with like a bayesian learning perspective where in the early phases there's like more plasticity and learning more mm -hmm. softness and openness of that statistical distribution and then there's kind of a hardening or a sharpening of certain things to to oversimplify that situation. Um, mm -hmm. And then also one relevant paper that they cite is from Sia Unica et al. And that's called the first prior from co-embodiment to co-homeostasis in early life. And so that was like a very, um, a really rich contribution to thinking about co-embodiment and that is also moving the discussion of the clinical setting and bridging it with this ecological and evolutionary and physiological setting. So this is a very interesting paper and, and um, something we'll talk about. So on to part two of perinatal. What, what else can we share about this? Okay, so some other quotes from the paper. Often the first communication and connection with one's mother occurs immediately after birth through skin to skin contact. This skin to skin contact is recommended because touch has been shown to help reset 
neural oscillators and align them with their parents' oscillation patterns in the neocortex, particularly in pre genual um, AAC, which I guess is the anterior cingulate cortex, all while reducing overall stress. <clears throat> uh, additionally, a caregiver's touch frequently induces a state of calm alertness, which frequently signals to the infant that the caregiver is attempting to communicate when newborn infants coordinate their limb movements to the rhythm of the adult speech, this intention to communicate is reciprocated. <clears throat> a strong bond between parent and child will ampl amplify the parasympathetic response to affectionate touch. Um, so, what, yeah, what I'm, you know, I'm noticing there is that there's they've chosen different examples of what might be oscillating or synchronizing. So, this the the neural oscillations seem to be something um, back to your question about uh you know rigid patterns i think of neural oscillations of having a kind of relatively fixed tempos um whereas something like limb movement is you know it's not necessarily a certain amount of hertz um so it may be more playful but um or unstructured um so yeah that's interesting yeah. and and one interesting part here is a caregiver's touch is signaling to the infant that the caregiver is attempting to communicate. And so from our adult perspective, um, we might be more familiar or remember more recently, like a child tugging on our shirt with the child trying to signal that they would like to communicate. That's like an ostentative cue from an active inference perspective. It's like a signal that is directing attention but then this is actually looking at it the other way, which is the touch from the caregiver signaling to the infant who may be in a pre-linguistic state that, that they want to communicate. And then also just, this is a really transdisciplinary area to think about like the perinatal care in terms of touch, which they're looking at here, but also other mechanisms that they brought up like gaze, body language. But then there's other features that aren't even explored as much in this papers regime of attention like the microbiome and the enculturation and so mm. and then it's just funny again to think about like the the postnatal care does mm. not end it just yeah kind of trails and develops mm. yeah you've uh you've included two really kind of big topics there the the microbiome and you know the appreciation now that 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 um passing on or the, the microbiome from mother to infant is is really really useful and then bioelectricity is that more sort of like the um let michael levin stuff and what i'm thinking there is that the, from that change from co-embodiment to um what was the other phrase co-embodiment and something else yeah what's the co-homeostasis yeah uh-huh yeah yeah. So yeah, bio bioelectricity there, and can it return during touch in a therapeutic setting? Yes. Mm. Okay. On to allostasis. So allostasis, the authors uh, define in the paper. Allostasis is a process by which the brain predictively regulates the body metabolic and energy needs using an internal model of that body in the world. And so um, the citation there is to Barrett 2017 with the work theory of constructed emotion an active inference account of interoception and categorization. So that's um, really a uh, cited and impactful paper that defined allostasis as the regulation of the internal milieu by anticipating physiological needs and preparing to meet them before they arise. So people might be more familiar with the uh, more popular cousin of allostasis, homeostasis, which is sometimes seen as like the return to a target range when there are deviations occurring away from that range. Like when the blood sugar or the temperature gets too low, a process kicks in that brings it back up. Allostasis is highlighting 
the way that sometimes that kind of physiological regulation cannot wait until something has already left a controlled range. And in fact, sometimes changes need to be taken in an anticipatory way to help meet expected changes that are upcoming. And then also a kind of corollary of that is homeostasis would suggest that we would just be converging and staying within a target range. But allostatic behavior can include, for example, taking deviations out of the range, again, in service of staying in that racket before one goes outside into the cold, that's going to transiently be raising the body temperature in a way that wouldn't make sense unless the person was preparing to go outside. But then in the sort of integral of action through time, putting on the jacket before going out into the cold is going to keep that physiological system happy and healthy and meeting its expectations in a way that's tractable. Whereas being inside and not needing a jacket at that moment, and then waiting until one was too cold and then putting it on then, um, that sounds like some childlike behavior perhaps in the way mm -hmm. in which different physiological regulators work. And then just one place where we've gone into a bit more on the technical side of allostasis was in live stream number 38, where we looked at certain um, cognitive and computational architectures and the way that they might evolve and the way that a simpler homeostatic system could elaborate over evolutionary time to include some allostatic features. Mm. Yeah, um, and what I'm thinking here is you, you helped me when you came on the Innocence channel to um, think about allostasis in a kind of uh, use these um, ant colonies and policy choices of uh, what the ant colony might do. And I was thinking back to the temperature example. Um, not only do we think about putting coats on and um, building houses and control controlling our immediate environment, but you're saying collectively uh, we have weather forecasters and weather stations to help our whole um, world predict into the future about how to take take action on our temperature regulation. Another thing then I'm just thinking what came to mind is um, we're going off the therapy. The, the, the film Don't Look Up came to mind of, um, you know, this uh, impending pressures on humanity, maybe climate change or whatever. And, you know, what um, what adaptive measures are we doing mm. collectively for the future? Yeah, like a like Predicting. a global or a, a bioregional allostasis instead of waiting for some toxic chemical to exceed a threshold what is the anticipatory action that's going to avert that from happening how can we recognize and take effective allostatic action not just homeostatic for all the reasons why bodies do allostasis in addition to homeostasis mm -hmm. and that concept of allostasis it does rely on this generative model that the entity is casting out into the future. And very much in line with that is the framework of predictive processing and predictive coding. We explored this more quite recently in live stream number 43. And without going into all the details, predictive processing brings together a few big ideas. Um, First, it is going to uh, hinge around the idea that what the brain or another cognitive system is doing is not simply recognition of, for example, incoming stimuli, but rather what's occurring is like a compromise down predictions. Top is just a spatial metaphor here, but the top down predictions that are being met with the bottom up sensory input that's a predictive coding or a predictive processing architecture. And that allows noisy or sparse or incomplete sensory data to kind of meet in the middle with rich generative models of the world so that action can be done effectively 
again, even when there's only partial data, like a dark room. And then also, especially when we think about action and how to include predictions about not just future stimuli, but predictions of one's future actions and the, the causes of one's actions and then the outcomes of one's actions in the world, this is going to return us to a core idea from active inference. And this is a quote from that paper in 43, where the minimization of a prediction error or surprise or free energy with some slight differences, but more similar than not, the minimization of those terms can be achieved through multiple ways. The first two are through immediate inference about the hidden states of the world, which is related to perception, as well as updating one's world model to make better predictions, which is learning. This is pointing to the relationship and the similarity between perception and learning in the Bayesian brain and active inference and related theories. And so the way in which you can reduce your free energy through learning and inference and perception, and also reducing your free energy or your prediction error through action to sample sensory data in a different way, as well as to potentially like change the world and modify the niche. So predictive processing brings together the anticipatory angle that we were just exploring with allostasis and connects it to specific computational and cognitive architectures that might actually be implementing that kind of an algorithm. Mm. Yeah, and wh where does touch fit into that? Yep. And then just one more slide on predictive processing. People can pause to read more or again, check out 43. But one thing that Maria brought up and, and we've continued to like think about is where do we use predictive coding and where are we thinking about predictive processing? And so um, maybe another way to think about the difference between these two for the formalisms and the implementations and predictive processing for a philosophical understanding that prediction is the basis of signal interpretation as opposed to description and recognition being the essence of signal interpretation or semiosis. So I think it's uh, um, referring to taking the active stance, not just with respect to action, but also with respect to our own sensory experience, which can feel, or one can be in culture to feel like it is a receptive process. I mean, don't the photons hit the retina and don't the pebbles hit our skin and so on. Yet even that, how can we see it in a generative and in a way potentially even with agency? And so here's mm -hmm. some books that are in the last several years that are reflecting the philosophical and the neurobiological work that's being done in this predictive area. Mm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I really like that difference there between coding and processing. If I'm thinking about touch and your comment earlier about one person might feel like a, a pat on the back or is um is a pat on the back but for some one person the, the processing might be supportive for another person it might be like fingers down a chalkboard um and uh yeah with you know any type of some person might you know most people wouldn't like a punch, but there might be some people who <laughs> get pleasure from from a, a punch. So the yeah, the coding and the processing, yeah, Great. sensing and interpreting. Great point. Okay, finally to active inference. So the authors uh, in this paper wrote active inference, which they use the AI acronym for. Active inference is an empirical integrative model that has been proposed to explain the dynamics and biobehavioral mechanisms of cooperative communication. So they cite the Vassal et al. paper from 2020. It's called A World Unto Itself, Human Communication as Active Inference. And this was actually discussed way back when in live stream number three. This paper has many, many interesting figures and formalisms. Um, the top figure is these two brains that are communicating. 
And it's fun because it's kind of like an equation free version of active inference and an idea on the left side through behavior is invoking something in the communicative partner. And that is updating their ideas, their cognitive model, which is reflected through their behavior. And that is like a feedback. So one can imagine this is like a conversation between two brains and bodies. So it does bring in embodiment because there is the integration of behavior in the interface between these two communicating brains. And it also opens up the door to thinking about like, well, how do we model ideas and cognition and things that we can't directly observe? What would be different if it wasn't just behavior in the interface? What if there was biofeedback or what if there was other kinds of interfaces? So that's hinting at the flexibility of active inference and also the way in which it can hopefully be insightful qualitatively or formally. And then we won't go into it right now, but in figure one is where we start to see what that formal layer looks like. All states could be an entity and the niche, like an entity in the world, or it could be two participants in a conversation. And then what are some of the formalisms that help us model that situation and uh, add in empirical data and ask what if questions in a really structured way? Mm. Yeah. And as, as I was looking, as you were talking through those two brains coming together, I was um, thinking back to a therapeutic alliance and then thought about other types of nervous systems that might come together therapeutically. So domesticated animals, I've, uh, if you've got a pet dog, um, then we might not be able to fully communicate like you and I can with words and actions as, as uh, deep in such a deep um, understand walkies and come to the door um, wagging its tail and there's a almost a therapeutic alliance if you know i'm stroking my dog and my parasympathetic nervous system is um there's an agreement there between me and the dog that there's an alliance that we're going to soothe each other um but we're not fully you know compared to a, a wild beast that might attack me um there's a different you know very yeah. different coupling coupling going on yep the flexibility just... you mentioned Yep. Um, a little bit more on active inference, which we'll hopefully unpack more in the dot one and two, but the authors write about active inference referring to the inversion of Bayesian generative models of the sensed world. So we can talk more about the sort of recognition model and the generative model. And then they also explore in um, their unpacking of active inference the ways in which perception and action are both in the common game of reducing surprise, reducing expected free energy. So lots to talk about, but the big questions are pretty much as always, <laughs> what is active inference and how is active inference being applied in this paper? And then this is the realism instrumentalism question are the bodies doing active inference? Do they have a choice to do it or not? Or is this an approach that we're taking to model these bodies? So mm. is active inference the territory of the clinical relationship? And or is active inference a map of the clinical relationship that's constructed about that territory? And so that's something that's always very rich to explore. Again, is it mm -hmm. something that the bodies are doing, that the physical therapist and the clients are doing? Or mm -hmm. is this how we're modeling what they are doing? Then what are they doing? <laughs> yes. Um, oh, so much to, to possibly say about that. Uh, yep. Won't go there quite yet. Perfect. <laughs> and then... Um, what would you like to add about the free energy principle and about the Bolin et al. paper? Yeah, so um, uh, I took a quote back from there. There are other, some of the authors on this paper were on the other paper in the series on inactivism and active inference. So there they said 
the free energy principle. Herein, free energy is defined as the difference between a system's predicted state and their actual state. Thus, minimizing free energy means avoiding surprise to keep within physiological bounds and the entropy of the system low. Um, and you know, a prerequisite is that for this notion is that different states are separated by Markov blankets, which define the boundaries of a system statistically by separating the internal states from the external states. However, active and sensory states, um, active states are governed by internal states, but affect external states, whereas sensory states are governed by external states, but affect internal states. Free energy is minimized either by perception, as you said on the earlier slide, um, by updating the prediction based on the sensation or action, changing the sensation through action to match prediction. Um, so when I, when I read these last bits in thinking about the Markov blanket and touch, and you know, you sort of said, um, is the is the touch internal or external? And then I'm thinking about this mm. co-embodied baby inside the womb. Um, where's the Markov blanket there, and where does the touch begin and end? And um, you know, touching someone physically in a therapy session or touching them with your words. Uh, and when someone becomes synchronized and starts to minimize free energy, is there a new Markov blanket formed between the coupled agent? Lots I'd like to have answers for. <laughs> awesome questions. We'll go into it. So that covers many of the keywords and background concepts. Let's jump to figure one. And so the paper has just very clear and delightful figures. And this is figure one. The caption is an overview of the effects of touch and therapeutic alliance on the different networks of the brain. So here in the center is a representation of a brain. And then with the labeling of some different brain regions and networks and systems, they're referencing different empirical work over the previous decade that has been connecting different brain region function and activation to all of these functions of bodies and brains and minds. So what's one that's like interesting to you or what do you see or how do we think about this sort of um, representation of brain regional function while also respecting the holism and the integrity of like the brain as a unit and the brain and the body? Mm. Yeah, I'm just going to sort of pick out there the, the person on the, the massage couch um, being touched and the, you know, you've got the CT fibers there, uh, C tactile fibers, which maybe are involved in this slow affectionate touch and the word insula there. So um, we talked before about that, that picture of fascia on your, your wall and um you know, is the, the connection between the C tactile fibers uh, and the insula um, through the connective tissue. Uh, that's, you know, joining the brain, a region of the brain up to the person's fingers. Um, that's That stood out to me. Cool. Yeah, it'll be awesome, like, to hear from authors and others just what kind of work did draw these connections and what are the next steps for developing that connection and understanding how there's synchrony within and among brain regions and within and among brains anything else to add on figure one um yeah just that, that the hypothalamus word just jumped out to me there so um if we're talking about sort of minimizing free energy and um the autonomic nervous system so one question that sort of came up when i first read the paper was the what, what are we on what level are we agreeing where the set points are that we're synchronizing towards or staying within so the 37 degrees c is the archetypal um temperature set point but not all 
members of a you know a, a, a duck egg has a slightly different preferred temperature than a chicken egg as it's being incubated and at what point in our evolution did we those those birds cooperatively agree within their therapeutic alliance to re uh, to adjust their set point and maintain that through whatever active inference um yeah those sorts of questions cool so on this slide i picked out just a few words that were really jumping out like touch as a core term and then the authors talked a lot about uncertainty repetition safety empathy synchrony and salience and i found the paper of mason 2019 and this safety and uncertainty framework which is kind of interesting because in active inference we often take a very formal approach to precision and certainty and confidence approaching those terms basically how they're used in Bayesian statistics, like confidence is a hyperparameter or precision is a parameter that reflects the variance of a distribution. And here's like a two by two matrix that is just saying, where are we from certainty to uncertainty and safety to unsafety? And that can be the physical and the social and the, the cognitive. And so how do we find ourselves in safer situations while respecting the variation among situations and where do we want to be and something about seeing this matrix gave me some certainty and safety almost like actually it is okay to be uncertain and if it's harmful then unsafe is not where one might want to be most mm -hmm. of the time but we also cannot only stay in the pure safety area 100% of the time. So mm -hmm. how is the therapeutic alliance in our own lives outside of the doctor's office? How are we in these quadrants and in this way? And how does this qualitative and kind of personal way of relating to safety and certainty related to perhaps more formal representations that we would bring in active inference. Brilliant. Um, yeah. And that, you know, those axes remind me of the valence and affect um, axes. So uncertainty could be like uncertainty, certainly could be like arousal and calmness and safety and unsafe could be pleasant and unpleasant. And then, you know, it's might, as you said, it might be fine to be safe and uncertain. It might be fine to be, aroused and pleasant um in which is excited but i don't want to spend too much time excited because it um is energy you know it's it's from a free min energy minimization it's quite maybe costly so um yeah and where does the therapeutic alliance and co-regulation come into all of that what are we agreeing on is a is a good balance and um safety and certainty are going to be very situational and related to that experience of the patient in this setting. So how can we foster a setting where people with very different backgrounds and priors and expectations and preferences can feel and be where they want to be in that quadrant? Maybe they even have different preferences for safety, or there might mm -hmm. be different preferences for certainty itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So adaptation to experts based on hierarchical structure. And you have um, brought up this creation of Adam painting by Michelangelo. So what made you share this art and what did you see in yeah. the session? <laughs> so um, when I was thinking about touch, I started to think, and I saw, I really liked this section in the paper about the role of experts. And I've not thought about it in what in that way in the therapeutic alliance so they used an example which was really helpful to me of um a child again going back to child and the parent is the expert and it's the child through touch the child is learning how to maybe regulate itself or soothe itself um so that's one example and then i started to think okay as we grow older or in different environments who's the expert and who's Regulating isn't you could say it's you know um 
peers. It could be a, a boss at work is the expert or in the practitioner patient example, it's assumed to be the, the clinician or the practitioner. Um, but then I thought, okay, above that, we've got government and politicians. And then I thought above that, we've got these um, symbolic maybe, or from religion, we've got the God as the expert. And that's when I sort of Googled this picture. And interestingly, um, on Wikipedia, it says that God, you know, that if you look at that picture, the God touching Adam is um, the shape around him is looks like a brain. And it's been supposed mm. that that's, uh, you know, um, suppose the internal model of the, the world um, held in the, the brain and, you know, which which model we held with inside us. Um, and how is that turning out through active influence? Wow. Here's all the all the brain regions in figure one. Um, <laughs> all of these other um, spirits and entities and then <laughs> crossing the Markov blanket tantalizingly close to touch but with that interface between them but is there a space between with the shared gaze and the shared regime of attention so it's very powerful interpretation we can mm. do some more um, art and meme interpretation because it's just really awesome how you shared that here um, mm -hmm. there's a section in the paper on adaption of priors to achieve, and that's going to be something we'll go more into detail in, but in this paper, they wrote the canonical loop of coupled action perception cycles is the process by which dyads generate and modify cycles until they achieve the end goal of aligning their mental states and communicative exchanges. This really highlights that we're not again, talking about metronomes in lockstep. Synchrony can include a conversation with two people with different perspectives. So synchrony is something a bit more general or looser than just the metronome. And the paper that they cite, Friston in 2015, shows some of the interesting modeling that's been done around birdsong. And so they model mm -hmm. a birdsong conversation where um, there's a shared narrative or they're singing from the same hymn sheet. And without going into any of the technical details, there's an expectation of how the song should sound. Like, I know how some songs sound. And then a bird either finds itself engaging in the action of singing that part of the song, and then stops singing after its turn duration has occurred and there's some reasons why it stops singing and then the other bird expecting the song to continue can reduce its uncertainty about the continuity of the song through two ways perception slash learning and action and so as long as your partner is singing you're reducing your uncertainty about the song or the conversation by listening actively and then when they stop you might continue to reduce your uncertainty about the conversation or the song by engaging in action. And so that's exactly what happens with this generalized synchrony and the synchrony manifold that's happening within one bird among brain regions, and then modeled in this paper of Friston and Frith with between two birds engaging in this bird song conversation. Mm. Yeah, and that's reminded me of something else that stood out to me in the paper about this. Um, they mentioned a couple of times that um, the, the basic one of the basic things that is being assumed in a therapeutic alliance or hopefully is an end point is that we are all identical or we're, we're all alike that was mentioned a couple of times in the paper and as you're sort of talking about the birds you know that and their expectation that that song is something that they hear and that they're going to sing themselves you can see maybe why music and um language is helping us be, you know self-evidently perpetuate our identity um but then you know i think i heard somewhere it might not be true that um bird song is soothing for humans as well so is it helping us remember that we're part of this community ecological community that's uh um mm. not i'm not identical in the species sense but 
some other sort of a likeness or expectation. Cool. The, the Interspecies Alliance. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One other section that uh, they have in the paper is increasing saliency within synchrony. So some important questions that we'll discuss more. What is salience? How are salience and synchrony associated? How, how is salience similar or different to observation or attention, regime of attention? And then they focus on a few different categories of mechanisms, including physiological mechanisms, social mechanisms that promote synchrony via salience, and clinical mechanisms. So if it's about synchrony, again, not in the lockstep way, in this generalized synchrony way, like a conversation, therapeutic alliance as an improvised, controlled novelty, productive conversation, how will synchrony occur and what is the relationship of salience to synchrony? Is it a precursor? Is it a, a, an after effect? Are they one and the same? And then what are some of the mechanisms that could be fostered to increase salience and synchrony? Or what are some of the rate limiting steps that one might look at if they wanted to promote like or heal synchrony and salience? Mm. Healing synchrony and salience, yeah. And um, the, you know, the, since the, the free energy principle and a lot of the active inference work uses, exploits mathematics, it's, um, Stephen Strogatz's work on the maths of synchrony. Mm. And uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't profess to understand it, um, but it'd be nice, interesting to see if um, that mathematics could be integrated with the FEP maths to help understand how, like you say, synchrony in these, in something like social mechanisms might occur mathematically. So in figure two, we have pulled back from the single brain. Figure one, we were, it was inside out. We were in the one brain context and figure two takes us into the two brain communicating brains and bodies context. And the caption is therapeutic alliance as active inference. And there's a similar aesthetic genre where now instead of the one brain with the brain regions being highlighted in different functions, now we're seeing at the dyad with this sort of handshake or touch occurring between them, we're seeing different functions and facets of the therapeutic alliance that are labeled with A through J. So what were one of these like functions that stood out to you or you think is interesting? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at B now. So the, the, it looks like someone on some crutches and then there's um, a caregiver helping the person and then thinking back to the, you know, the alliance bit, I'm um, thinking what the shared goals might be there. So, you know, it's um, is the 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 caregiver, you know, agreeing with the person on what they're going to do rehab wise, um, and then how might that, when it comes to touch help the person update their beliefs about how soon they can they can heal um so that it becomes uh uh smooth a process as possible yeah and what i'm really liking about this it's bringing in some aspects of the therapeutic alliance and process that at least from what i've seen are not discussed in such a holistic way like F, what have I done? Like just the confusion and shock when something mm -hmm. surprising is happening in the body. And it's like, am I going to be able to use this finger again? And how could I feel selfish about having injured my finger in this way when others are in this situation? And some <laughs> of these like metacognitive states like H, anxiety over the injury, the bark can be worse than the bite. And then J, previous priors. So that could be 
consciously or experienced priors or just in a broader sense, implicit statistical priors surrounding the injury, including injury beliefs, social expectations, and family and injury history. And so that kind of takes the predisposition, family history, epigenetic, perpetuating cycles discussion and puts it into this prior expectation preference framework. Like what does one expect health to look like given the types of healths that they saw in their family development? Mm, yeah, in their family and maybe um, culturally we've got uh, these expectations about um, uh, obesity and then you know uh, uh the what we're being um what types of products are available to us what types of foods are in our in our niche um and then when you get into epigenetics and all of that then it soon becomes uh very interesting great well I think this the figures are are very evocative and they'll be excellent for the discussants to just reflect on um one other section just to leave a little footnote is they wrote about allostasis coordination attention and the stag hunt so they brought together all these very cool ideas and brought it to the setting of the stag hunt which is a classical game theory and philosophy setting and this is a matrix that can be read as like a payoff matrix and there's two participants who can either choose to hunt for rabbit hair which has a smaller possible payoff but one can hunt it alone however if they both engage in the stag hunt like the big prize they can have a higher payoff so if they both collaborate and work on the stag hunt they could both get you know half of a stag whereas if they both go for the hair then perhaps they could both be confident or sure or not sure about getting a hair but like it's like a smaller possible reward but it doesn't require coordination and this has explored some of the philosophical and social implications with the citation that they provide to, to skirms 2001 and this is just a very uh, rich area for thinking about collaboration, coordination, public goods, what kind of pre-play helps people go for the stag? Again, this isn't just about meat hunting. This is like a model of generalized coordination. Like we could co-author an amazing paper or we could have two lesser papers that might take longer. But of course we could also engage in the collaboration and get bogged down and then we could have no paper. So how do we manage the risks and the reward of coordination and collaboration? How is that related to shared attention? And how is that related to allostasis? Where's touch? So mm -hmm. they're really just bringing in so many rich threads and, and I was not expecting the stag hunt to appear, but then applying the stag hunt to the therapeutic alliance is quite interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes. And the, you know, the, they're the kind of alliance the, the working together for the benefits of the, the alliance versus maybe giving someone some exercises to do on their own. Um, or pursuing self-care on their own versus care in a in a, an alliance way is uh, I've not thought about it in that way before in terms of the you know the the group benefit of group work versus self-care on one's own. Yeah, like a regional mm. emergency room. What does it mm. look like for us to be cooperating as best as we can with the health needs of this area? How are we going to be going for the stag? together rather than succeeding or failing to get the rabbit alone mm. um and then oh yeah go for it um no i think it's slightly slightly off topic i was just thinking about the you know the more related to the stag how we approach agriculture at the moment and um uh you know the 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 benefit of being able to get lots of 
food for cheap for cheap and in abundance on our health seems immediately to be a a benefit but then for the overall health of um mm. cheap abundant food long term might not be that good if as opposed to going out and moving your body and um uh foraging on your own which takes more energy but your um it's better for your health arguably mm. Hmm. cool and then just one other random note or reference to bring in this is a paper that i worked on in 2018 with my partner alexandra and we were highlighting this communication and co-creation not from the clinical therapeutic alliance setting but from the joint drawing and joint improvisation setting but we hmm. touched on a lot of very similar topics about consensual and positive communication and controlled novelty and the narrative trajectory. So I wondered where's art and aesthetics and beauty and some of these other ineffables or semi effables in the therapeutic relationship. You have a, um, a body on your wall behind you. I have a body on the wall behind me. The body is beautiful and where does art and culture and touch and healing come together mm -hmm. well yeah the, the you know the art is the expressed outward kind of um output of some imagery or symbols that the artist has found within them um and therapeutically you know the use of visualization along with therapeutic touch to update someone's belief. So, you know, I uh, use with my clients sometimes, ask them to depict how their their um, injured shoulder, what what image, what vis vision do they get when they describe their injured shoulder compared to their healthy shoulder? And, you know, one of them said um, that the, the, the bad shoulder feels like a rigid piece of guttering on a house that's gone rail in the sun whereas the good shoulder feels like gooey custard um it's nice and warm and then you know how can you transfer that belief about the injured the, the injured shoulder into the the gooey one so you know you've got some potential use of art therapy or even just visualization and symbols to um in combination with touch and movement and conversation um so yeah very interesting. Awesome. Awesome. And then um, we have the open slide for 44.1 and point two. Um, we're going to continue to add questions in the coming week and people can submit questions or participate live if they'd like. I'm really interested to do some discussion of like, what are the active inference entities that we're going to model? Is it the person? Okay, then what are the sense states, the action states? What is the generative model that we're going to actually put on paper? And so where does active inference come into play? And how are we going to take the next step? Because so many threads have been brought together in this paper, evidenced by the keywords and the bibliography and so on. And then what is the next step? Who are the next audiences to update their cognitive model? to think and act differently. How does the clinical setting look different in the active hospital or in the active exercise area or whatever it happens to be? Like, what does the therapeutic alliance look like in an active inference model? And what are the next steps for those who want to be engaged in that work? Mm. And yeah, we'll just continue to explore. Um, what are some of your any closing ish thoughts? Um, yeah, wonderful paper. I'm really interested in, you know, how other. Um, so this is written by uh, a group of sort of people who have who's interested in osteopathy. Um, but uh, the way I see it, it could be applied to um, talking therapies, other hands on therapies. So is this a useful common language to understand lots of different already successful um, therapeutic approaches and interventions. Um, 
that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, how do we begin to um, use some of the jargon that we might have been using now? Um, how do we find a way to take the active inference um, language to people who've never heard of act active inference before? And then, you know, <laughs> finally, the uh, something that came up as I was reading, it's kind of an alternative hypothesis about this, um, you know, assumption that synchrony and the therapeutic alliance will always result in minimizing free energy. And, you know, I just had this thought, what if um, a, you know, a, a, within the therapeutic alliance, a caregiver and the, the patient agreed that they, they synchronized their quantum reference frame or whatever to um to say okay we're going to choose medically assisted dying here um is that still minimizing free energy or not um and is it helpful for the person is it soothing them you know so is it is it always minimizing free energy wow very deep with the birth and life control and the mm -hmm. uh, vital nature of what the therapeutic alliance truly is so also thanks for just this awesome discussion and all the dot zero slide making that we got to engage in so looking forward to the coming weeks of discussion talk to you later thank you very much daniel excellent see you later see you next week bye bye